It's a treacherous night on the road. The highway, a two-lane speedway, is shrouded in darkness and rain, and I'm still at least an hour away from home. How did it come to this? Part of me wants to just turn the wheel, let my SUV flip, and bid farewell to this mess. But I won't. I can't. I have two kids I love, and despite everything, I still love my wife. As I inch closer to home, I wonder what awaits me there. I'm filled with a mix of anger and confusion. Could my wife really be cheating on me? And with that guy I fear she is. I'll find out soon enough. Within the hour, I'll know for sure. Glancing at the dashboard clock, it reads 5 o'clock p.m. Friday, November 14, 2013. It's dark, cold, and wet outside. I should have replaced or at least checked my tires. I know they're almost bald, but this is my runaround truck, not my good one. No one else drives this beat-up old thing but me. I'd never let Diana near it. It's too risky. I only used it today because I wanted my nephew, John, to have my good vehicle. John, just 19 years old now, recently graduated from high school and decided to take a year off to work before heading to college. He's my oldest brother's eldest son, a great kid. John has been working for me, mainly splitting firewood since he sprained his ankle. All right, I'll confess, I'm a farm boy, but not just that. I graduated from high school and went to college, finishing in four years. I'm not some tough guy, just someone who works hard for my family. I don't possess any extraordinary skills, I just put in the effort. I did serve in the Army Reserves, though, wore the uniform with pride. I only made it to E5 and never got deployed overseas, thankfully, and I've been out for 15 years now. It might have been just the motor pool, but I'm still proud of my service. I love my country. My parents raised five kids. I'm the middle child, third out of five. This road is treacherous. It's slick from a light rain, more mist than rain, making everything slippery. People seem more careless when the roads are like this. Dan, I'm running late. According to John, if I hurry, I might make it there before it's too late. All right, so where exactly is this there? It's at a Motel 6, just off Interstate Route 81 in Pennsylvania. And who's at that Motel 6? Well, it's none other than my infuriating wife, Diana, along with her so-called lover, Scott Jenkins. I need to get there. I need to stop her before she does something we'll both regret. Today, John had my good truck so he could keep an eye on Diana while I drove to Martinsburg to settle some scores with a couple of jerks who thought they could cheat a couple of kids who worked for me. Those boys had delivered eight cords of good seasoned oak firewood to this guy's house. But then he got all nasty, claiming the wood wasn't up to par and refusing to pay. He even had his brother with him for some intimidation tactics. Martinsburg is now part of the outermost ring of the D.C. suburbs, where housing is expensive and firewood sells for $200 a cord. Cutting and splitting wood is tough and dangerous work, and nobody's going to shortchange me and my workers out of $1,600. I had a baseball bat on the back seat to make sure of it, and you bet I got our money. Diana knew I had to be out, and I guess she saw this as her golden opportunity to get away with something. But I don't think she took John into account. John has been filling me in on the Diana Scott situation for weeks now. Scott's quite the ladies' man, and he's been showing interest in Diana. Nothing has happened yet, but it seems like today or tonight might be their big chance. I notice I'm running low on gas. I should pull over and call John to get the latest. This whole situation is really getting to me. Diana has always been quite demanding, but I have to admit, I'm not the easiest person to deal with either. We've been married for 15 years and have two kids, Travis, who's 12, and Jesse, who's 11. They're both amazing kids, and I love them dearly. I also love their mom. I met Diana through my younger sister, who was friends with her in college. Diana came from a wealthy family, was the prom queen, lead cheerleader, and the most popular girl in high school. And that popularity followed her to college, 
where guys flocked to her like she was some sort of magnet. How did we meet? My sister dragged me to the Fall Apple Festival outside Gettysburg one September. I think it was 1995. Hyanna was there, dishing out those tasteless fries they called festival fries. To me, they tasted awful. I was grumbling to my sister about waiting in line for this junk when the girl behind the table whacked me on the head with an umbrella. She hit me and said, If you don't like my fries, why are you even waiting? I couldn't let her one-up me, so I smirked and said, Who are you, elephant girl? I said that because she was taller than me. That's when my sister stepped in. Diana, she said, I want you to meet my little brother, Frank. The tall one smirked. I can see why you call him your little brother. Where'd you find him? Munchkinland. And that's how it all began. A few minutes later, we were all at a picnic table, exchanging witty remarks. Was I smitten? Absolutely. But I knew I couldn't let her know. She was among the most striking women I had ever met, and she had found me at a vulnerable moment. My college sweetheart had relocated to California in search of her ideal match. Diana found herself in a similar situation on the rebound. Her previous boyfriend had a couple of issues. First, according to Diana, he couldn't remain faithful. And second, he expected her to be intimate with him. When she refused, he left. I learned about Diana's ex on one of our initial dates. It seemed like she was giving me a heads up about a few things. Firstly, she wanted me to understand that if we were dating, it meant exclusivity. And secondly, she wasn't interested in physical intimacy unless we were married. She pretty much indicated she was a virgin. Yeah, right. Like I believe that. That kind of innocence is rare nowadays. We dated for a year before I propose. I was nervous about it, fearing she might be biding her time until someone better came along. I presented her with a ring and asked if she wanted to continue what we had started. She laughed and said nothing had started yet, but she was willing to give it a shot. I stopped at a gas station, grabbed some fuel, a cup of black coffee, and a bag of chips. I'm not supposed to indulge in snacks like chips. They're on Diana's list of forbidden foods. I'm also banned from sodas, white bread, candy, ice cream, chocolate, or any pastries. Diana says my cholesterol is too high. I needed to use the restroom. While I was in there, I couldn't help but wonder why she didn't consider messing with me and why she chose to involve herself with someone like Scott Jenkins, who's basically worthless. It was eating me up inside. I'm not one of those guys who spends all day on the road. I'm not lazy. I provide for my family. I went to college. I'm not dumb. When I graduated, I knew I wouldn't get far with my dad's farm. I have two older brothers. Sure, if I stayed there, I'd just be another hired hand, but I wasn't cut out for an office job either. Our grandparents helped me out. I invested in some lawn equipment and started my own lawn service, which did pretty well. But the competition was tough, so I teamed up with some farmers who owned large wooded areas and got into the firewood business. That worked out, but I still had a lot of downtime in the winter so I started buying snow removal equipment. Now I'm running a lawn service, a firewood business, and during winter, I've struck deals with several businesses and even one of the counties to help clear the roads and parking lots when it snows. I'd say Diana and I are doing pretty well. Diana handles our books, manages payroll, and handles most of the hiring and firing. After I took care of business in the bathroom, I grabbed some coffee and chips, hopped in my jeep, and dialed John. He answered on the first ring. Uncle Frank, I've got some bad news. I don't shy away from the truth. What is it, John? Aunt Diana and Mr. Jenkins got a room at the Motel 6. They're there now. All right, John. I replied. I'm on my way. John asked. What are you going to do, Uncle Frank? I'm not sure yet. I admitted. I turned the ignition and merged onto the highway. I estimated another 40 minutes before I'd have the full story. I drove as fast as I could within the speed limit, but apparently I was going faster than I realized. 
I got pulled over not for speeding, but for a busted taillight. Why a state trooper would choose to stop me in the dark in the midst of misty, foggy rain I couldn't fathom. Nevertheless, I accepted the inspection ticket, thanked him, and continued on my way, another fifteen minutes behind schedule. The whole situation with Scott Jenkins was a farce, a terrible one at that. He was a newcomer in town, a braggart, and a master of exaggeration but he had money and somehow managed to snag a membership of the country club my wife, Diana, insisted we join. Diana is like a golden goddess, standing at a statuesque 5'11". With captivating blue eyes, she possesses the kind of beauty that could start wars. Her name is Diana, fittingly so. Homer famously said the Spartan woman's beauty launched a thousand ships. Well, my Diana is so stunning. She could probably make the D-Day Armada seem insignificant. She's well aware of her allure, and for over fifteen years she's used her breathtaking beauty to tease me relentlessly. Not that I mind much. I give her as good as I get. Diana is two inches taller than me, and when she wears her high heels, she towers over me. And she does it on purpose. Often at the club, when she's dressed in one of her sleek and alluring black dresses, black stockings, and shiny patent leather heels, I intentionally opt for heelless moccasins. She wears those heels just to get under my skin, and I wear the moccasins to retaliate. It's been this way for as long as I can remember. We bicker with each other about everything, at least in public. At home, it's a different story. In public, I can never seem to do anything right. At home, well, I'm never in the wrong. It's unimaginable that she'd be involved with someone like Scott Jenkins. Everyone knows about the conflicts between Diana and me. According to John, that's what led to her current predicament. I called Jenkins a blowhard, and apparently, according to John, Mr. Blowhard made a bet that he could seduce my wife before Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving's just a week away. John mentioned he'd been taking bets, offering odds lately. It's devastating. I can't fathom Diana doing something like this. If she knew it was over a bet, she'd be furious. But Diana isn't one to indulge in gossip. She wouldn't entertain them. Yet, she's been acting strangely lately. She's distant at home. Sometimes when I enter a room while she's on the phone, she either leaves or speaks very softly. Other times, I've tried calling her and couldn't reach her. This last bit worries me even more especially since she's so involved in our business. She's always been easily reachable, but not lately. It's like she's preoccupied with something else, like she has other things on her mind. I pulled over to the side of the road and dialed John's number again. He answered promptly. Hello, John. I said. Yeah, Uncle Frank. It's me. Is it? I'm sorry, Uncle Frank. I didn't get a good look at her face, but she was wearing that dark brown raincoat, and you know how she styles her blonde hair in that long French braid. And it was definitely her hat. I didn't see her Lexus. He was the one driving. I guess she met him somewhere. I could hear John holding back tears, so I reassured him, Hang in there, John. I'm on my way. Something else was weighing on my mind. It was November 15th. My birthday had been on the 12th. I had turned 40. Diana never mentioned a word. Ever since the kids came along, we always made birthdays special. Not in terms of lavish gifts, but with simple things like cake, ice cream, candles, and singing happy birthday. I deliberately sing off-key just to annoy Diana. I always tell her not to make a fuss, but secretly I enjoy it. It stung a little when Tuesday passed without anyone acknowledging my birthday. Well, now I guess I understand why. I accelerated, determined to find out the truth. Damn it. I was going to catch her. Should I call home? I pulled over and dialed the house number. Hello, my mom answered. Hey, mom, it's me. Oh, Diana. She had to step out. I'm watching the kids until she gets back. Do you know when she'll be back? No, Frank. She didn't say exactly. Just that she'd be gone for a while not to call her, and that she'd be back before you got home. Okay, thanks. 
Mom. Well, that settles it. Diana's out with the big shit, unknowingly helping him win his bet, while my mom is home with my kids. I felt like crying. I didn't, of course. I just felt the urge. Diana and I had discussed fidelity before we got married. I had fooled around a bit before meeting her, but not much. Diana, on the other hand, was every guy's fantasy. I couldn't imagine her having less experience than me. Throughout our dating and year-long engagement, she insisted she was a virgin. I didn't believe her, but I never pushed it. We had the big wedding. We're both Methodists, so choosing a church was easy. We picked hers. My parents didn't mind. They fell in love with her the first time they met her, as did all my siblings. Our wedding drew nearly 300 people. It was a sweltering June day, one of the hottest of the year. For our honeymoon, we went to Niagara Falls. Where else would we go? Throughout our dating years, I felt like I was always under scrutiny. With four siblings, numerous nieces, nephews, and cousins, all enamored with Diana. I couldn't even have a private moment without someone informing her about every little detail. As for me keeping an eye on Diana, it never crossed my mind. I figured if she truly loved me, she'd remain faithful. And if she didn't, I didn't want to know. As for her claim of being a virgin, I always thought it was nonsense. I held on to that belief until our wedding night when I discovered she truly was a virgin. I took Diana's virginity. She had never been with another man. Why now? Why after seventeen years of public battles and private adoration would she betray us and for someone like Scott Jenkins? I had to push these thoughts out of my mind. Dwelling on them would only lead to tears, or so I told myself. Men don't cry, at least not in my family. I recall our wedding night vividly. I remember how petite she looked, how frightened she seemed. It struck me, given the two years we'd spent together, hearing her boastfulness, all the stories of her popularity, the countless boys she turned down, and the many hearts she claimed to have broken. I knew I was fortunate. She didn't have to remind me. I remembered when her ex, her last serious boyfriend, resurfaced. It was like something out of a song, like Roy Orbison's Running Scared. I knew she had cared deeply for him, enough to almost give him her most prized possession. For months I had been uneasy, fearing his return. But when he did show up, just like in the song, she chose me. I felt invincible that day, walking on air. Yet later, she shattered my confidence by saying she was only with me out of pity. I brushed it off, thinking, so what? I still bid to keep the prize. I refused to entertain the idea of Jenkins. Our bond was too strong, or so I believed. I glanced at the dashboard clock. Just ten minutes more. Ten minutes, and I'd reach the motel. What was my plan? I had no clue. Ahead, I spotted a light. They had left it on for me. But was it the right motel chain? Parking beside my trusty truck, John stepped out. Jenkins left already. They weren't in there long together. Mrs. McBlain, my aunt, she's still inside. John informed me as he approached. Thanks, John, I muttered, heading for the door. My entire life was on the verge of collapse. I recalled the fear I felt when our kids were born. It was Diana who kept me calm. I reminisced about our adventures, trips to Hershey, New York for plays with our kids, Branson, Nashville, our kids' elementary school graduations. I remembered the time Diana broke her foot and I pushed her around Walmart in a wheelchair. We had a dog, a big black lab. Diana was carrying a paper plate full of junk food down the stairs to the cellar when the dog jumped up, causing her to fall and break her foot. I had to carry her out to the car. She cried like a baby. I pondered about the LaMaze classes, our baby's first words, their first steps, and the dreadful day when her dad passed away from a heart attack due to high cholesterol, as the doctors had warned. Perhaps that's why she insisted on putting me on a diet. Would I lose it all? I almost turned back. I didn't want to face her. I didn't know what I would say. We both understood the importance of fidelity. If I went to that door, there would be no forgiveness, 
and it would all end badly. Nevertheless, I made it to the door of the motel room, marked 123, and knocked. Silence. I knocked again. A voice from inside snapped. I told you to go away. I wasn't doing that. The voice wasn't familiar. I knocked harder. It's not who you think it is. I insisted. The door opened a crack, secured with a chain. It wasn't Diana. I wanted to shout, to rage, to cry. Who are you? Are you the police? The woman inside demanded. I quickly thought on my feet, reached into my pocket, and pulled out the wad of bills I'd received from the two men who'd attempted to swindle my boys earlier. I handed a fifty through the door. Here. I said, please let me in just for a minute. There was a moment of silence before the door creaked open slowly. The woman stood back, shrouded in darkness, holding what seemed to be a pistol. Her voice was a menacing whisper as she asked, You're not the police. I replied, No, ma'am. She gestured toward the floor with the object in her hand, and I obediently knelt down. Then who are you? She demanded. I kept my hands raised, mimicking the gestures from old cowboy movies. It dawned on me what was going on. I believe I'm the husband of the woman you were impersonating tonight. I said. She kept the object pointed at me, and now I could see it wasn't actually a pistol, though I couldn't identify what it was. What do you know about that? She pressed. I explained. The man you were with earlier made some bets that he could sleep with my wife before Thanksgiving. The words caught in my throat. I noticed a blonde wig on the bureau beside the bed. But it seems he must have paid you instead. She grimaced. Yeah, a real creep. Can I get up? I asked. She set down the chicken wing she was holding, and I noticed the KFC box. Yeah, you can get up, but don't try anything. I know Karat. I doubted her martial arts skills. But I wasn't concerned. Glancing at the clock on the bureau, I saw it was still pretty early. How much did he pay you? I inquired. I could see the wheels turning in her head. Five hundred dollars, she replied. My guess was he probably paid her a lot less. How would you like to make another five hundred dollars? I offered. What do I have to do? She asked. It's still early. I bet Jenkins, that's the guy who paid you, is at the country club right now collecting on the bet he thinks he won. I'll pay you another five hundred dollars if you come with me now and expose him. She held out her hand. Money. I peeled off the necessary number of Franklins. I was glad I didn't let those two bastards who tried to cheat me pay with a check. I'd made them go with me to their bank and draw out the $1,600 in cash. Now, paying her would wipe out a lot of hard work, but I figured it would be more than worth it. While the escort slipped on her coat, I dialed home once more. My mom picked up. Hello. Is Diana back yet? No, she's still out. When will you be home? I need to get back to your father, she replied. I'll be a little while, I responded, sensing her annoyance. But what I had in mind was too important. Once the escort and I were in my old SUV, we headed for the country club. John had already left, but Jenkins was still there. As we arrived, I got the escort to dress up like my wife again and we confidently entered the country club. It was just after dinner, so the place was bustling. They even had a small band playing, ensuring a lively atmosphere for the night. We strolled past the front desk and headed straight to the restaurant and bar area. Scott Jenkins was at the bar with a group of men. Taking my new companion by the arm, I guided her over to the bar. I greeted Ethan Bailey, who was standing next to Jenkins. Hey, Ethan, I said. You've met my wife before. Ethan was taken aback. Jenkins turned around, catching sight of the woman, and went pale. Hey, Scott. Hey, guys. I continued. You've all met my wife. You remember her. She's been with Scott here all afternoon. With a swift movement, the woman removed her wig. Ethan, quick on the uptake, glanced at Scott. I think you owe me some money, Scott. Jenkins reached into his pocket, producing a roll of bills. 
He peeled off a few and handed them to Ethan. But Ethan wasn't finished. Now how about my winnings? Scott nodded, realizing his oversight, and peeled off several more bills. By then, several other guys had gathered behind Ethan, and Jenkins was reaching for his checkbook. I couldn't help but wonder how many of these men had placed bets on whether my wife would sleep with this guy. Mentally, I noted down every person in line, recognizing one of them as an officer of the club. About that time, the club president noticed the line forming and the exchange of money. Betting and settling bets were fine, but it was against the club's etiquette to collect or at the bar. It was deemed uncouth. The president approached briskly. What's happening here? I turned to face him. These gentlemen all made wagers with Mr. Jenkins here that he could seduce my wife before Thanksgiving. It appears Scott here failed, so he paid this lady to impersonate my wife. He must have taken pictures as proof. The president nodded thoughtfully. Is that so? Jenkins attempted to brush it off. It was just a joke. Nothing serious. I interjected. It wouldn't have been a joke if I hadn't intervened. My wife would have been embarrassed. Then I addressed the president. I apologize, Mr. Lewis. I'll withdraw my family's membership in the morning. The president firmly grasped my elbow, his tone resolute. No, you won't. He directed his gaze at Jenkins. I want you out of here right now, then turned to the other club officer involved in the bet. You too, get out. As I swept over the rest of the men, all six of them, I want to see all of you first thing in the morning. None of you should bother to tee off, and don't think I won't remember who you are. I believe all of you will be seeking a new club and a new course very soon, and if any other clubs in the area inquire why you're no longer with us. I'll make sure they know. I glanced at the men, some of whom I considered friends, good guys. I knew some of their wives were close friends with Diana. It was a shame. A real shame. The president maintained his grip on my elbow. Mr. McBlain, Frank, please reconsider. We need members like you here. I pondered if he genuinely meant it, or if he was remembering the times I cleared the parking lot during winter without charge. It dawned on me then that we wouldn't leave, not immediately at least. If we did, it might insinuate that my wife was somehow involved, and I wasn't going to let anything or anyone hurt Diana. This hurts, Mr. Lewis. Diana is my wife. I'll let you know. I acknowledged the men with a nod, then escorted the prostitute out of the club. Once outside, I walked her back to the motel. After expressing my gratitude, I inquired if she had transportation arranged. She assured me she did, so I bid her farewell and headed home. During the drive, I couldn't shake off thoughts of Diana's whereabouts. It wasn't terribly late. Perhaps she was out doing some early Christmas shopping or preparing for Thanksgiving dinner. But beyond that, exhaustion weighed heavily on me. It wasn't just the long drive or the troubles with the potential cheats in Martinsburg. It was the whole ordeal of the country club with Jenkins and my so-called friends who had wagered on my wife's fidelity. As I turned onto my street, all I craved was my TV, my comfy chair, and a bowl of rocky fudge ice cream. But Dan, I knew Diana wouldn't let me have that ice cream. Approaching my house, I noticed cars strewn all over. Dan, someone must be throwing a party. Our street was usually quiet filled with ranch-style homes, but it seemed someone was having a grand celebration, even parking on my lawn. It hit me like a ton of bricks. The party was at my house. Did I miss something? If Diana had planned something and I forgot, I was in for a world of trouble. Since my driveway was blocked, I parked on the street and made my way up the walk. God bless America. I knew it. I was in deep trouble. I eased the door open with as little noise as possible, hoping to slip in unnoticed. But as the door swung open, I was met with a dazzling array of lights and a large sign someone had put up. The room was packed with people, and suddenly, a chorus of voices erupted, shouting, Surprise! Happy birthday! Amidst the cacophony, Diana hurried over to me. 
She was dressed in a pale blue button-up blouse and a dark blue miniskirt, both accentuating her figure in a way that made it clear why anyone would be attracted to her. Where were you? She asked anxiously. We've been worried. My kids were having fun. My nephew John, grinning like a lying turd, threw a trash ball at me. Diana took my hand and pressed her breasts against me. I murmured softly. I had to make a quick stop at the club. She leaned down, towering over me, and planted a sloppy, affectionate kiss on my cheek, the kind I secretly adored. This wasn't about any bets at the country club, was it? She whispered. My cheeks flushed. She knew she had known all along. As she spun around, her long blonde French braid swiped across my face. Can't wait until everyone leaves, I thought to myself. She wrapped her arms around me and gently pulled me towards the living room. Come on in. We've got your cake, ice cream, presents, your favorite potato chips with dip and more, she announced to the gathered crowd. Look, everyone, Frank's home. My husband, my big handsome hero. And indeed I was. And there it was, a story of love, a true hallmark moment. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.